Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen strange things today. In our gospel reading for today, a paralyzed man is lowered down through the roof of Jesus' home. Just picturing in this in my head is outrageous. Can you imagine if your house was filled with people and suddenly you up, look up and see a hole appear in the roof and someone being lowered down? In Luke's gospel, the roof is made of tiles which would be familiar to his Greek readers. Mark's gospel has a roof made of mud and sticks. And as a carpenter's apprentice, I can imagine he took pride in the construction of his roof. So the picture of people up on the roof, tearing up tiles, and then lowering a paralyzed person down to the crowd is a shocking image. What kind of friends would go to this length for someone? This is truly what it means to love one another as God loves us. When I think about this gospel reading, I ask myself some hard questions. Do I have the kind of friends who would do this for me? What would have happened to this man if he didn't have these friends, this community around him? And am I being the kind of friend who would go to this length for anyone? This season of Advent is a season of waiting and watching. The days are short and the nights are long as we await the coming of the Lord. It's a time for giving thanks for our family and friends, and it's easy to picture ourselves doing whatever it takes for those of us closest to us. But while we're waiting with our families and friends for the coming of the Lord, Perhaps we should turn our gaze outward to those living with paralysis on the fringes of society. There is more than one type of paralysis. We can become so dependent on something that we are unable to function without it. Many of us have experienced traumas in our lives. Some of us are living with PTSD as a result of those traumas. And we are all living with generational trauma that has been passed down from people we never knew personally. And a nod to Dr. Robinson in his class. <laughs> we can't just flip a switch and get rid of these. Society has taught us that we should be ashamed of mental illness and trauma, and we should never speak of it. Each of us has learned to cope with that trauma and its effects. Some of us learn to use drugs and alcohol to cope with that trauma. We also became attached to other things like food, TV, sex, and gambling. I myself was paralyzed by drug and alcohol abuse for most of my life. I was abused as a child and I had to live with the trauma and shame of it. Alcohol and drugs were the only thing that gave me comfort. That made me feel normal. But then they started to paralyze me. I was unable to function with or without them. And when alcohol and drugs took over, I began to isolate from everyone in my life. I pushed anyone away who threatened my alcoholism and addiction. I was not a very lovable person. And needless to say, I didn't have much of a community to depend on. But there were a few people who wouldn't give up on me. And I'm so grateful for them. Because I was that paralyzed man. And if I'm being honest, I may not be alive today if it wasn't for the community around me. We live in an era that has been described as neoliberalism. We as a society are obsessed with our individual rights and getting ahead at the expense of others. We compete for everything. Jobs, housing, even food and water. 
It seems to be an economy of scarcity and individuality, with survival of the fittest as our mantra. But what does Jesus teach us? Does he teach us to compete against others for the prize? Does he teach that there isn't enough for all of us? Does his message convey an economy of scarcity? Or is it one of abundance? If we do live in a world of abundance, why do some of us hoard money and resources? Our whole society today is geared for the individual, not the community. But Jesus is telling us something drastically different. It's clear from the gospel reading that this man wouldn't have been saved if not for the community around him. And Jesus is telling us that we must live in community and love our neighbors. Each of us in this chapel today is blessed to have a community around us. The main reason I picked seminary in the Southwest was because I felt that community as soon as I visited here. I didn't get this feeling anywhere else I visited. I knew that I wanted that kind of support network around me. And believe me, I needed it. Seminary can make you question all sorts of things. But the community around me kept me going. And it continues to support me as I move forward. The community here continues to form me and show me exactly what is meant by becoming beloved community. As the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement, we are called to love one another in radical ways, even if it means breaking through a roof or two. We live in strange times. Our relationships have been suffering. Church attendance is at an all-time low. The percentage of people who describe themselves as religious or spiritual has been dropping steadily for decades. And suddenly there is a plague that is forcing us to stay away from one another. Isolated and living in fear, people have turned to alcohol and drugs in record numbers. Addictions have skyrocketed during the pandemic. More people are abusing alcohol and opioids than ever before. Statistics don't lie. Each and every one of us has a family member suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. And many of us have suffered some type of trauma in our lives. What can we do to help? How can we be beloved community for them? The first thing that we must do is not give up on them. Even though some of our neighbors try to push us away, we must not give up. We should continue to love them and try to help them. There is a narrative from society that people who are addicts or alcoholics choose the life they live, that they deserve their circumstances. That it is their own fault that they live on the streets. But God doesn't define neighbor as just the person who looks like us. Or dresses like us. And that means loving them despite the fact that they may be different from us. They may speak a different language or vote differently. One of my heroes, Catholic activist Dorothy Day, Paraphrase Jesus, and she quipped, I really only love God as much as the person I love the least. This is a much needed kick in the gut when I'm feeling self righteous. <laughs> we were made to love God, and because the imprint of God is found in every one of God's children, we were made to love one another. And we are made perfect when we are doing this. And I'll tip my hat to Augustine and Aquinas on that one. Amen. We are all part of one body of Christ. All people, not just Episcopalians or Americans or even Christians, all people. 
And if we see one of our neighbors hurting or in trouble, we must reach out and help them. And because if even one part of the body is sick, it will affect the rest of the body of Christ. Because we are all part of the same thing, our community is the entire world. But first, we must be there for those people who are directly around us. And that is not just our family and friends. That part is the easy part. We must reach out to those in our community who need help and do what we can for them. We must not ever give up on them. Because if we give up, we are giving up on ourselves and we're giving up on God. Today is December 7th. Some of us know today as Pearl Harbor Day, known forever as a day that will live in infamy. From the famous speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Today in Austin, there are veterans living on the streets without a place to live, without food, without medicines. These people didn't choose to go to war. They joined the military to get training and a job in a certain country. And some of them have been thrown away by society. Many of them live in a hell created by the trauma and are drug and alcohol addicts. They are our siblings in Christ, and they are a hurting part of the body of Christ. We must continue to reach out to them and let them know we love them. So, as we continue to wait in this season of Advent, we must ask ourselves some questions. We must ask if we are the kind of friends who would go to any length for someone. And what length would we go to in order to save one of our neighbors? And not just our neighbors across the street. The neighbors living under the overpasses, the ones with PTSD. As we ponder the coming of Jesus, let us look for him in the faces of the least among us. The ones who live through the hell of trauma and abuse. And let us reach out our hands and show them what becoming beloved community really is. Let the entire world see strange things today and be filled with awe. My prayer for us today is this. Gracious and loving God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to us today. Open our hearts and our minds. Remove the planks from our eyes and help us to see our neighbors as part of you. Give us the strength and courage to walk in your ways and do your will, reaching out to those who are living without shelter, without food or medicine. And as we wait for you in this season of Advent, let your light shine through us for others to see. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.